Welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. Episode 114 is an interview with John Stocker from Oxfordshire. He ran a last one standing world record with more than 337 miles in 81 hours, just over three days, at the Suffolk Backyard Ultra, which was held the weekend of the 5th of June. <clears throat> John has run many ultras, including the Thames Ring, the Spine, the Arc of Attrition and Spartathlon. He is a father to three children, a husband and a coach. I hope you enjoy this interview. If you do enjoy this episode, please go on over to Apple Podcasts to rate, review and subscribe. It really helps grow the audience and the show and I do appreciate your help and the time that it takes. Are injuries or niggles ruining your enjoyment of running and hindering your performance? Get on top of these and see the specialists at Health and High Performance. Utilising the latest in technology and with a wealth of experience, the team at Health and High Performance can assist you with all your running injury and performance needs. So to get back to enjoying your running and achieving the results you are capable of, head to healthhp.com.au forward slash run or find them on Instagram, Health High Performance. Health and High Performance are located in Mont Albert, Melbourne, but are available for telehealth appointments, not only Australia-wide, but also around the world. Contact them on their website to find out more. Wild Earth Australia are the online store to help you make the most of the outdoors with top quality gear at great prices. Peak Endurance podcast listeners can use the discount code Peak Endurance, all capitals, to get 10% off their already awesome prices at checkout. Head on over to wildearth.com.au to get everything you need for your next adventure. Peak Endurance Coaching will help you achieve your running goals through providing customized, customized plans that reflect your commitments in life and your athletic history. You will become fitter, faster and stronger whilst becoming part of the Peak Endurance Coaching community. Don't waste a minute of your running journey. Email me, Isabel, at peakendurancecoaching.com.au to get a program designed just for you started. Enjoy this chat with John, I'm sure you will, and also have a great week of running. Hi, John, and welcome to the Big Endurance Podcast. Good morning. How's it going? Yeah, very well, thank you. You just got back from a run, you were saying. I, uh, I just made it around in time just to get back, uh, throw a clean T-shirt on and uh, <laughs> be here ready to have a chat with you. Excellent. We're very, we're very pleased that you're able to make it. Now, just for anyone who, who doesn't know a lot about your background, can you tell the listeners a bit about yourself, your athletic background and how you got into ultra running? Okay, my, uh, my athletic background really started uh, with my work. I'm a, I'm a personal trainer. Um, I had clients that wanted to do five and 10 Ks. And at that point, I lifted weights and I didn't run. I um, couldn't run. I couldn't run a mile. So I had to start working on that because taking a client out and being the one struggling to have your client pull you around <laughs> just really didn't look right as a personal trainer. No. So that kind of got me going back in the 1990s. I did marathons back there and uh, started doing marathons and feeling that they just weren't enough. Uh, we'd get to the end of the marathon and it, it wasn't tiring enough. So after that, after thinking marathon was the biggest distance in the world that anyone could ever run, you get introduced <laughs> to this ultra running community and it blows your mind slightly. Um, mm. And that then kind of like snowboarded quite quickly into going to the 50 milers to the 100 milers um, stick around the 100 miles for a little while trying to get quicker but realizing that I was never going to be that fast guy at the front I was never going to be the one that was shot off and did it in under 17 hours um, so instead I looked for more distance and that kind of like led me to go further instead yeah no that's fair enough how many how many hundred miles did you do all up do you know um four eight I think I've done over 1200 miles oh wow that's a lot. That's a lot. That's awesome. Now, um, you recently set a record at the Suffolk Backyard Ultra, completing 337 miles, or for the Australian listeners, 542.57 kilometres, <laughs> in 81 hours, being the last one standing. Now, congratulations on an absolutely amazing achievement. That is Thank awesome. You. 
Yeah. So what made you into this race? What made you want to do this race? Okay. I did the race the year previous um, and it was my first backyard ultra. It had been changed to October. So it was quite bad weather. It was 12 hours of darkness. Um, right. And for me, that, that was the one struggle with 12 hours of darkness. But enjoyed the race, uh, had a great time and won the race with 41 loops. Oh, okay. Um, yep. In, in winning that race in 41 loops, um, and I know, I know we've had banter myself and a, another runner about this, is the gentleman that came second handed me the trophy and said, uh, I'll let you win this year. Uh, are you coming back next year? And that, that enticed me to go back just to make sure that just make sure that it wasn't a fluke and that I was able to put my name to win in that race. So hence going back again and uh, giving it another go. Yeah, so, well, it definitely wasn't in October. So how many hours of, of daylight did you have this time then? Well, on, in this time, there was literally only five hours. So only five hours of darkness this time. Oh, uh, that's which awesome. Five loops, uh, absolutely brilliant. No problem with that at all. They kind of yeah. came and went before you realised you were going through darkness. It was, <laughs> um, it was, it was lovely. Yeah, that's, that would make a huge difference. And what was the actual weather like? Um, I think it's one of the hottest weekends we've had here so far. It went so we had in October it was it was raining for the whole weekend, and this time we got burnt and it was 23, <laughs> 24 degrees, and there was no clouds in the sky. Mm. I run better in the heat. I I suffer a little bit in cold weather, so the heat weather and hot I'm I'm cool with. I'm okay. Ah, oh, okay. Well, well, that was that was fortunate for you then. So how does doing this sort of a race compare to doing, say, a 100-miler? Um, probably bad for me to say, but I, I guess um, I feel that maybe it's slightly easier doing this because you, you've only got to concentrate. You've got to stay switched on for those four miles, that one loop. All you've got to concentrate on is that one loop. You don't want to think about any further than that. You think about the one loop that you're on, and that's it. You go back to your tent or back to your chair. You reset, mm -hmm. and you do another loop. The 100 miler, you, you're already concentrating on that 20, 30 miles down the road to hit checkpoint two or three. And it's that continuous onward battle. Um, I find with this, I'm able to reset. I get to the tent and I've just got to do one more loop. Yeah. Yep. And, and you don't find that it's sort of you, you get out of your rhythm by having that stop? No, I find if I can set the pace in each loop, so I'm doing trying to hit the mile marker at exactly the same time each loop, trying to run my own race, then I find that I'm not getting too rushed or getting too um, out, of, out of sync, really. I get back to the checkpoint with roughly 13, 14 minutes to go each time, uh, enough time to have something to eat or just sort out any problems, any feet problems, and then back up for the whistle, and off we go again. Yeah, yeah. So you find 13 or 14 minutes was was optimum for you? Plenty. Any more than that. And I just feel like I was I was cramping up. I was, I was getting too stiff. Yeah. Um, it, that was enough to get it, a small amount of food in, three, 400 calories in, let it digest, have a sit for a few minutes and be ready to go again. I was almost thinking that that was quite a long time. You didn't find that too long? No, I found by the time, uh, time if I had something hot or food-wise to eat, you'd have that down. You'd sort out your feet. Um, you'd be sitting there waiting for the whistle. Usually, I'd finish and ready, so the the three-minute whistle would go, and I'm I'm just about ready to go. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. How do you train for an event like this when you don't know how long you're going to be out there? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I guess it's it's keeping your consistency with your training, doing the back-to-back -back days with your training, doing the, the longer miles, but also, I don't know, I, I guess it's just trying to also train mentally for that, that longer mm. period. I guess by doing the 100 miles, you've got that mental state that you can go further, but not knowing how far this one's going to go. Um, I was, I've been fortunate that I've done further distance in my running career, that I have gone further than that, and it's been able to keep me going for longer yeah yep and so when you did train for you know you talked about back to back days did you ever do like 10 12 whatever hours of doing you know that kind of 
four miles and then you know having a little rest and doing it as, as the race structure yeah no i never i never got into practicing like that i know a few guys have been out and they've done the the four miles and uh they've done some of the online challenges that replicate what they do in the backyard race where they do the every hour go out and do another four miles but mm. i never i never went and did that there's training um i'm guessing the the weekend before i ran the grand union canal race of 145 <laughs> miles Seriously? i'm guessing that that that, that <laughs> helped with training i guess that that gave me a good taper run ready before the I was race gonna say, was, that, was that your taper run <laughs> that was my taper run uh it didn't go to plan i ended up a little bit of a sunstroke and a little bit of hypothermia but um we might oh, we were nice able to in. We, we, we still got there and um it was kind of like a, a learning lesson ready for the following weekend and, and did you rest that week or did you run I'd be lying if I said I rested, but um, I did do a few miles, not too many, just a few yeah. miles just to tick legs over. I did some core work and some strength work, and then the rest was waiting for the race. So you would still do strength work with weights uh, the week of a race or just body weight? Probably strength work with weights as well, because <laughs> I enjoy it. Wow, you um, must have amazing think, recovery think- skills. Most uh, most people that have asked me so far have asked me if I have a coach, and I can tell you now I don't have a coach. I don't think anyone <laughs> would enjoy coaching me at all. Um, I mix my weights and my core working on the week of a race. I try to stick to the same routines. Maybe one or two days before a race, I might bring the mileage down. Um, but so you don't really that, taper at all. I d- yes. I, I bring the mileage down. In one or two not, days. I don't, have, I don't have a complete day off, if, you're, if that's what you're asking. Um, I think mentally um, I feel better, even if I go out for three to five miles the day before a big race, just to keep the legs ticking over. But dropping it to an easy pace, keeping the heart rate yeah. down low, um, being one of those easy runs, maybe going out with friends and just going out and enjoying it. Yeah, but like normally people would taper for like two weeks not to a hundred mile race before but you know so you don't do any sort of cutting back gradually over two weeks or anything like that um i would drop my mileage from 100 miles a week down to maybe 70 and 50 okay maybe down to 30 miles so i would drop the mileage but i'd make my i'd make sure i could run each day so drop my daily mileage down if if that makes sense i'd still then put my core work in and i'd still put my strength work in yeah, yeah. No, no, that, that makes sense. That's that sounds that sounds better, doesn't it? Yeah, that does sound better. <laughs> um and so you'd obviously raced that course before, so you didn't even need to run on the course just to see what it was like or anything. You kind of knew it. Yeah, I, I remembered the course quite well. Um I remembered from the year before where I had to hit what marker at what time. Yeah. Um uh, when to walk, when to run, uh when to uh ease back slightly. So yeah. It's a, it's a lovely course. Yeah, I was about to ask you what was your strategy going into the race. So you obviously had a walk-run strategy. Yeah, very much so. Um, and, and running the whole thing, I don't think would work, would work for me. Um, you'd just get back. You'd get back to the start-finish line too early. Um, yeah. You'd burn yourself out too quick. And for me, it was all about the longevity of it, trying to go longer and further, not worrying about being the fastest guy in every time. Um, trying to be back there before everyone else. I, I was quite happy running my own race and just just tickling along at the pace that I wanted to do. Yeah, no, that sounds like a smart strategy, and obviously was. Um, did your, was your walking um, based on terrain or on time? Um, on both, really. If I hit a mile marker too early, I knew I had to put some walking in. If I was starting to come back to the start-finish line before 45 minutes, I had to put some more walking gaps in there. Um, yeah. There were some hilly bits and, you know, in ultras, we all say, why run the hills? So uh, we walked up the hills and used that as a good walking rest. The time to put um, any food or drink in as well. Yeah, yeah. So you did eat while out on the course, not just on, on your little breaks. Um, things, uh, little snack bars, um, no major food, just little snack bars or yeah. anything just to keep a, a few uh, calories going in, that's all. Yeah. Now, um, I'm, I'm also an online running coach and I ask some of my clients if they would have some questions for you. So <laughs> um, Tracy wanted to ask, how do you go about mentally preparing for an event of this length? Do you set it in your mind 
you know, oh, I'm going to go for at least 80 hours? Or did you just work through it in stages? Because obviously you didn't really know how long it would be. How did you mentally prepare for that? Okay, um, for me, I think I've talked about it a few times, is I, um, I, have to, I, I have to tick boxes. And before a race of like this, I have to make sure everything is ticked. I can't go to a race if I've got one of these boxes in my head that's still open or unticked. As small as things as if my kids want to do something, I need to make sure I've done everything they want to do. Any jobs around the house or if my wife needed something doing, those jobs had to be done. Because when it comes to those dark hours, um, mm. any small little thing can be massive in your head. And if you're going two or three days with no sleep, they will just explode in you and yeah. that will stop you dead. So for me, I have tick boxes. And as long as I've got all those boxes ticked, I can keep going. Um, on the relationship to where I wanted to get to in the race, I gave the registration the same answer I gave them the year before. And that was simply, I'm there to run every loop everyone else will, and I'll run one more. And that was my goal. That was yeah. the only goal I had. Because if I'd set myself a goal for 24 hours or 100 miles, then where do you go when, you, when you've reached that goal? You, you have yeah. nowhere. You have more reason in your head then to stop. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's fair enough. Yeah. And um, so how uh, Megs wanted to know how you organised your crew to help you the best. And oh, who wow. was your crew? Um, my crew, um, no, I've got, I've got to start, I guess, with my first crew, and that was my mum, because uh, she stayed at home and looked after my kids. So without <sighs> yeah. her, yes. that's another tick box. It's making sure my kids are safe yeah. and happy. So without my mum being here looking after the kids, that'd be something that would play on my mind. So... My mum was here. My wife came with me to the race. She came the year before because she wanted to see me finish and she had to leave the year before. And a day later, I finished. So she missed the finish the year before. So this year, she took that extra day off, not realising that we were going to be going for two to three days more. And again, this year, she had to leave early to come back to see the kids and to go to work and miss the finish. I have a very good friend called Sue who does amazing through the night. She doesn't sleep the same as myself, and she crewed me the whole way through. So she stayed with me the whole race. And a good friend, Bruce, uh, popped along to uh, help and support as well. So we, we, had, we had a good team. And like you know, in any of the ultra runs, your crew really matter. Oh, and they're yeah. the ones that, even though you're out there doing the work, without that crew being behind you, without that support, you, you won't make it. Yeah, yeah. And so did you give them any special instructions on how to look after you or do they kind of know you well enough? How does that all work? I asked my wife the other day, actually, that I said to her that I, I'm really easy to crew. And she laughed. She <laughs> disagreed with that straight away. She said, I'm horrendous to crew. I come into a checkpoint. I don't know what to eat. I don't know what oh. I want to eat. I haven't got a clue what to drink or when about. My crew look after me very well. They, uh, they feed me the, the salts when I need them. They put the, the good food in me when I need it. We, we don't use, I don't use any gels. Um, I only use natural food, so okay. cooked food, um, anything that I can do that I'd normally eat at home and I'm not changing so it doesn't change the routine. Um, that's what we went for in the race as well. So we, we took campus so we did chili con carne one night. We, we did pancakes. We, oh. we cooked beans just normal food um yeah. and they looked after me really well yeah oh, that's that's awesome and and that's great to know about the food i mean i can't imagine going for 80 odd hours and having gels that would just be it, it destroy me the only yeah. supplement i use and the only one i have to mention is tailwind oh, um yeah. tailwind cola flavor with extra caffeine and i use that through the evening slots um as yeah. soon as we've done the evening slots then i'd come off the caffeine and just go back to water um, yeah. and just use water around the loops. Um, but through the evening, that was the one thing that came again was the tailwind caffeine. And so you didn't use electrolytes at any other time of the day then? No, I found using the food was enough. It kept yeah. enough salts going in. Um, the water was great. Um, as many ice creams and ice lollies as we could get <laughs> hold of to keep us cool. Um, yeah. yeah, no, it, was, it, was, it went really well. Oh, that's good. So you didn't suffer from gastric distress at, at any time? No, not at all. Um, had really, Touchwood had really good race. Um, food went in well. Um, 
Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't suffer with anything really. I had, um, I may have one or two bouts where the heat got to me a little bit, but it was uh, like on one loop only, and after that, absolutely fine. Yeah. Now, in regards to you eating real food, do you do that same tactic with with hundred milers, where it's a bit harder to have food cooked? Yeah, no, very much so. We try to still, even if it's not hot food, we stick with the normal food. So we take out the sandwiches, we take out the wraps and uh, the the different um, foods that we use here and we take those on the race with us. And, uh, you know, going through the aid stations, get out of that plastic bag and take a load of picnic stuff with you, take it onto the course. Um, I don't I don't run well with gels. I find they, they upset my stomach too much. The only thing I have found in the past is, is the tailwind sits nicely with me so i've just kind of stuck with keeping it simple and sweet just stuck with what uh i know works for me uh i don't really go very far from that and i just stick yeah. with that really no oh, that makes sense <clears throat> um glenn asked what was your approach to sleep in this event now i have heard that you did not sleep at all like not even a little kip at all Okay, so the year before we we um, we tried to sleep in October and it didn't really work. I had a, a chair, I put my feet up on the cool box, and it yeah. just didn't seem to be enough. So this year we went along with the tactic: we'd take some flat bed camp beds, and um, it it was the idea to get to the night section and put my head down and get to sleep. And the first time I tried it, I felt as sick as a dog. Um, oh. I just did not get on with it. I put my head down and I think it was just the adrenaline running through and knowing that I had a few minutes and that whistle was going to go. I just, I couldn't settle. Um, I couldn't settle. So we gave up with that idea. We tried it once and it just wasn't working. So no sleep for the event. So how do you deal with that sleep deprivation? Like for myself, I, I find I'm, I get all wonky and like you don't get any of that. My wife calls it like watching dizzy dummies. They come into the checkpoints and then they go back out again. They're like dizzy <laughs> dummies. But it's um, it's it's quite okay. I found the first, first night went quite quickly. Being over five hours, it was, yeah. it was over and done with quite quickly. As soon as that dawn chorus hits, it's like switching a light bulb on and it's a, it's a brand new day and you're ready to go again. Yeah. Night two was the only wobble I had. I went past uh, in the forest one section and then in my head, I, I thought I'd done the next section already. And mm. I arrived at that section. It was like, wow. Okay, I thought, <laughs> I thought I'd done that again. Um, so that was the only part, really, that I got that tired. Um, during the day, absolutely fine. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Um, I heard you took a bit of a fall on your last lap. Was yeah. that because of tiredness or just because kind of you knew it was the last lap and maybe you stopped concentrating as much? It, it might have been something to do with that or it might have been that when we left on that loop, um, we didn't know. We didn't know it was going to be the last loop um, oh, because Matthew okay. Matthew had gone out ahead of me. Um, <sighs> it was the one loop. It was 8 o'clock in the evening. And talking about those tick boxes, one of my tick boxes is to make sure I ring my kids and say goodnight. So oh. I was on the phone oh. doing a video call with my kids oh. saying goodnight. Oh, but I'd fallen, I'd fallen, thanks. I'd fallen 10 minutes behind in time. Uh, so oh. where I wanted to be, I was, I was 10 minutes running late. Oh, no. I came into the forest. I knew I could make those 10 minutes up and maybe I'd have a shorter stop on this loop. I was okay with that because I ticked a box. I was, that was it. I yeah. had to make sure. Yeah. As I went into that forest, Matthew was walking back towards me. And, oh. and my initial thought was, have you dropped anything? Have you lost your headphones? Um, not to think he was going to turn to me and say, I'm out. He, he wow. does it. He, he finished. So at that point, I looked at my watch and I was 10 minutes behind. I had to push through the next two or three miles trying to catch up on that time, getting messages from my crew saying, Matthew's arrived back. This is, this is the last loop. You, you've got to finish this loop in time. Um, and coming, I'd already fallen a few times in the, in the loops before, just with the, the oh, tree okay. roots are so small in the forest. Coming out on that last loop, we all, we all have it, don't we? We all have that that last lap that we have in our head that we want that music in our headphones to be playing. We mm -hmm. want to come in, run into that tune. <laughs> and I was just getting the phone out ready to do that. I was pushing hard and I just, I must've caught a little tree stump on the foot and I went and I hit the floor hard and I hit mm -hmm. the, it was concrete that I hit and I went mm -hmm. down and I laid there. My phone went across the road 
And I laid there and I actually laid there and I thought that I'd messed it all up. I thought that was the end mm. of my race. I thought I'd, I couldn't breathe and I was just laying there and it took two or three minutes for me to get up. Wow. Uh, lots of pain in the ribs um, yeah. and just kind of wobbled along the road a little bit, hobbled along, got to jogging, got the music playing and realized that I had about half a mile to go. Uh, I think if you look at my splits, I think each lap is either 46, 47 minutes. This last lap, I came in at 52 and a half. So it, it was a, it was touch and go. I, I really worried that laying there that I'd messed it all yeah. up. But um, mm. yeah, we, we got up and we finished it. But it's been a few few weeks now and we still got we still got pain in ribs. But we're, we're ah, getting there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, pa- rib, rib pain can stay for a while, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it hurts. Yeah um wow so that that would have been quite quite stressful really yeah it was and, a bit yeah so I mean like as you were heading into you know 80 hours were you starting to wonder how long it would possibly go you weren't thinking about that at all you were just thinking one lap at a time or yeah still trying to think still trying to keep that um, motion that just you know one loop at a time just tick them off and each loop is fine I didn't really know what the mileage was. I, I wasn't trying to count the mileage and I wasn't trying to count the loops either. I just left it. We knew we'd broken the European loop. The race director, Lindley Chambers, told us that. Uh, he yeah. then advertised to us and dangled that carrot in front of us that nine more loops and it's the world record. And, yeah. and when I went into this race, I didn't even know there was a world record or a European record in it. So I went there oh, just, okay. to, just to go there and, and yeah. run a race and win it and hopefully make my kids proud and bring a trophy home and show them you know what I can do um and and try and get them out and doing stuff and that was that was the whole reason for going there when we broke the world record um I think that's when maybe we me and Matthew we still I think we now hold the record for the longest head-to-head battle 44 loops so 44 loops just me and Matthew going around oh wow okay um, so everyone else had dropped loops. out. Yeah, yeah. Everyone else had dropped out after 37 loops. Me and Matthew yeah. went around 44 loops on our own. So it's the it's the record for the biggest head to head. I think after we broke the world record, it then became obvious that neither of us was going to drop easily, um, and it was going to take something. So I think then race race uh, head came back on again, and I think mental tactics. I think both of us put headphones back in. The yeah. chit chat between us two was cut to a minimum and we were, we were just out there to run each loop then and it was just down to seeing who who was going to go the furthest talking about Matthew you know there was no signs of him on that loop when he went out in mm-hmm. stopping that's that just that's the I guess I don't know scary thing that he he was ahead of me running absolutely fine mm-hmm. and going fine and it was only he got he, and in an interview he said himself he got to the edge of the woods and looked around and didn't know where he was or what he was doing until he looked down at his shorts and saw his race number and then went, aha, I'm in a race. And then just went, no, I've had enough. And it's literally, so physically, I think Matthew could have gone further. Mentally, it's, that's it. The switch went and that was the end of his race. Yeah. Yeah, And I think, uh, yeah, once that goes, yeah. Once that goes, that's, that's nothing you can do. No, that's right. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Um, so, so do you have some high points from from the race, like particularly moments that really were enjoyable? Um, I, I, I think I quite I, I enjoyed the whole thing. I enjoyed the whole race. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't really find any part of that race uh, a struggle or a, a problem. I didn't come back to the checkpoint saying, "Oh my god, I want to go home. Let's go." Mm-hmm. Um, it, it went on longer than what I expected it to. Um, yeah. I was able to keep in touch with the kids and keep in touch with home. So I was happy with that one. Uh, The weather, I enjoyed the weather more uh, because it was hot Mm. and sunny. So I quite enjoyed the heat out there. Um, Yeah, no, I I enjoyed all of it. I got to run with some great guys on the first 24 hours before everyone decided to leave us to it. Um, I got to run with some great guys I'd met the year before. Uh, Carl and Matthew, two great runners there that, you know, for the first 24 hours, I just, I hung with them. And uh, it was it was almost like twenty four hours of just catching up with other runners oh, and nice. seeing people and, and just chit and chatting. It, it was great fun. It was. Yeah. So um. So how many people started? Uh, I think it was um. I want to say one hundred and twenty nine. Wow. 
So um, how did the course or how did it change running the course with, you know, 129 people out there compared to two people? Yeah, um, it's not as busy when it's only two of you. <laughs> um, and there are sections where if you're not running together to make a world record or a European record and you're out there on your own, there's sections where you are on your own. That mm. maybe Matthew's gone on a quick lap and I haven't seen him for the whole lap. Or maybe I've gone ahead of Matthew and he's struggling slightly and you, you don't see each other for the whole, because it's quite short, tight turns, uh, you don't see each other for maybe a whole lap. You get back in and you, you sit in your tent and you wait to see the other runner come back in again. So yeah. that that gave you space to run. When there's 129, it was going off in waves, obviously COVID restrictions, it was in yeah. waves, so you, you were restricted. So you're only in your wave. Um but that was okay. It, it kind of like, it, it was nice. It was nice to have that company. Um, it was nice to have other people around you. Yeah, it was okay. It was good. Yeah. So when it was just the two of you out there, were, were there any, you know, sort of mind games going on or were you just happy to run together and just see what happens? I think to start with, there was definitely mind games because after it was just the two of us, it was uh, no talking, headphones in, head down. Until yeah. someone advertised to us the European record and said, "Look, guys, if you guys actually run together, if you keep yeah. each other going, you you could beat you could beat the European record." It was only set two weeks earlier, so oh, that, wow. I felt yeah. like at, at that point, kind of we we got together and we we ran with each other, we walked sections together, we stayed with each other. We came in early morning, we'd broken the European record. Yeah. Um, then after that, we, you know, tiredness has kicked in a little bit then and going around the loops, you kind of get to know each other a bit more. I knew Matthew before the event anyway. I'd run with him in Spartathlon. Um, okay. And we, we chatted about it being slightly unfair, the race where one person's going to walk away with the records, one person's mm. going to walk away with, with nothing. And I think tiredness took over slightly and we, we decided to go and challenge the race director and uh, say to him that we're, we're happy between the two of us to split these prizes, to let one of us take the records and one of us take the trophy and the win. And true to Lindley Chambers' um, record, he was spot on. He told our crews to put us in the tent, tell us to uh, behave and get ready for the next loop. <laughs> because even though, yes, it is an unfair race, that's what the race is. It's last man yes. standing. Um, one yeah. takes all and the, you know but you're never you're only as good as your assist because with yes. the race rules you're only allowed to run one more lap yeah so yeah. as soon as number two drops you can run one more on your own become the last man standing and that's as far as you're allowed to go so yeah. um yeah there was, there was some talk out there but we got put back in our place by the race director and just <laughs> told to uh get told to go back to it I think after the world record was set, that's when the real mind game started. And that's when you were just high and by at the start. One would go off running. I always made sure I was the last one out of the start area. I never went out the start area first. I was okay. always the last one out of that start area. Why there was that? no need to rush. Everyone, yeah. everyone, everyone left there in a hurry. And I was quite happy to walk the first corner and walk the first straight and then yeah. start jogging. Um, and just it, it was my thing I always wanted to be the last one out of the crowd I was never the last one back but I was always the last one out yeah yeah now that's that's fair enough and um can I ask what was the song that you were trying to get on for the finish <laughs> um I think it was uh now this is really bad isn't it I think it was uh, probably my one I was trying to get hold of was um this is me theme tune from the greatest showman Oh, I love that song. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, That's great. That, that shows me, doesn't it, now? But um, <laughs> yeah, this, this is me. It says it all, isn't it? You, you take yeah. me as I am, you know, no yeah. matter my battle scars or not, this is me and this is who I am. Yeah, no, I like I like that choice. And and it's a decent length song too, so it would have lasted a while. It gave me enough time <laughs> to get into the finish. Yeah, exactly. Um, so how how has your recovery been? And seeing as you're so good at recovering, but well, or do you do anything special to help you recover so well? Um, I try to make sure that um, I, I get plenty of sleep um, afterwards. I'm not very great at that. I, I got home at half four on the Wednesday morning uh, after I've been brought home. I slept for two hours. Then I stayed up for the rest of that day, mainly because I wasn't prepared, I guess, for the media storm that was just about to hit me <laughs> yeah. and hit my phone. 
Um, it didn't stop for the whole day. Um, I went there to, as I said before, I went there to run a race. I, I didn't expect to come away with a world record or with yeah. the attention that it's brought with it. Um, and I've kind of struggled with that slightly. As for the recovery, um, by Sunday, I was back out running five miles. Um, I, I air boot. Do you do air boots? Yeah. I know right. of them. I, yeah. Uh, air reflex, air boots. I, I use those. Um, we use um, Compex as well. Yeah. Um, but mainly just getting back out there, just very slow, easy miles, ticking it through, not racing, not pushing, keeping the heart rate low, even putting some going out for some walks and getting to walks mm. in there. Because, you know, even with ultras, you've, you've got to walk. So yes. practicing that walking uh, is oh, a great definitely. recovery as well so yeah. yeah back into i'm back into the core work um i start strength work soon as well uh i think last week we put 73 miles in last week so we're we're back yeah you are definitely and so you didn't have any like residual tiredness for like at least a week or something you were just bang like if you, it's almost like what you did was like getting rid of jet lag you just stayed up and you didn't go to sleep but try to yeah yeah you didn't find any tiredness like for the next few days I'd, I'd say I was tired, but my problem was that fall on the concrete. Um, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't lay on my ribs. Um, oh. So it, it worked against me slightly. I was, I had, it took me longer to catch up on sleep. It took me, it's only maybe this week that I've been able to be laying on my ribs properly. I've had to lay oh. on pillows, um, take painkillers. Um, so at the moment, it's my, it's my first week probably of proper sleep this week. And that's what, two, three, four weeks ago now. Did you get them checked out? No. <laughs> I kind of figured that would be does, the answer. Does any, runner, does any runner volunteer to go to a doctor no. and go, by the way, I've just run 300 odd miles. I fell over, I hurt my ribs. And wait for that face of that doctor to go, why would you do that? <laughs> exactly. No, I didn't go. Yeah, no, no. And there's nothing they can do anyway. I was just wondering, no. I'm, I'm guessing they're, they're probably broken, but do you think? Yeah, maybe cracked one or two there. Yeah. Um, I know on the first few um, falls, I had them checked at the race and they were, we think they were just badly bruised. But that one, I went down. Yeah. I wasn't expecting it. Um, and onto the concrete, it, it took my yeah. brow. I laid there for a good few minutes. Yeah, because if you were holding your phone, you wouldn't have been able to put your hands out, obviously. I didn't get any hands down at all. Yeah, yeah. No, um, obviously with your win and world record, you're up for, you know, doing the actual gigs backyard in America. With the COVID situation, are you able to travel to do that? Uh, at the moment, <laughs> uh, as it stands right today, no. Um, yeah. Even though America is an amber state, um, it's uh, not allowing any uh, commercial British flights into America at the moment. Oh, so okay. at the moment... We are literally sitting here waiting to, fingers crossed, be allowed into America. We're hoping when restrictions get lifted in July that maybe that'll be a case and maybe we'll be able to get into America. But so at the moment, I think everyone in the big backyard race is waiting to book flights. Um, mm. No one's booked any yet. So we're just, we're just holding off and keeping fingers crossed. So you can't get any kind of special exemption as an athlete? I so wish I could, but I don't, I don't think there's any... Any uh, anything out there for me to be able to um, pull on for me to get in? If if anyone listening to this knows of a way of getting us <laughs> in there, then please do get in touch. That'd be great. Yeah. But as far as I know, looking at it, that no, we can't get in there. Oh God! Well, I mean, I'm sure it would it would roll over to the next year, but you you want to do it now, so I get that. I, I would like to give it a go this year. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so when when is that? If it go, if you are able to get that. <clears throat> October, 17th of October. Yeah. So it sounds quite a way away, but actually oh, it's not, it's not really. that far. It's no. not that far. July's coming. Um, yeah. We've only got two or three months and we're there. So, yeah, it's, it's quite scary thinking that I'm going to be putting my foot on the same line as the, as the greats in the race. Um, yeah. I think I might be asked to leave the race if I keep going around asking for selfies with all of them. <laughs> but um, that'd be quite But you're one of cool. the greats in the race now too, you see. Uh, no, I don't see it like that. I see it like I'm just on maybe, <laughs> maybe I've been put in the wrong race, but um, it'd be cool to be there anyway. Yeah, no, it definitely would be. So do you have any um, races planned for before then? Just a lazy 100 mile of the week before or something? Have you have you heard my interviews already? Yeah, no, I'm, uh, 
so Bruce, a very good friend, um, is doing his first ever 100 miler and I've got to be there. Um, oh. I've trained with him and um, I work with him. So we've got 100 miles in Wales, uh, a coastal 100 miler to do. And then the yep. following weekend, my wife uh, has us booked in to do the Lakeland 50 miler. So <laughs> two back to back races quite close together. Um, going to do both of those, tick around those, have good fun, uh, enjoy talking to people. Um, I quite like running in the pack as well, running and talking to people as we run. Um, and then after that, that takes us to August. And then maybe then I'll start looking at just the training miles, uh, no more races, and then concentrate on getting ready for bigs. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Those those two races, would you be doing them at, you know, A race intensity? Would I be, what, sorry? You know, like A race intensity, like, like your top intensity, or would you talk about talking with people, you're just kind of cruising them. Tra- long training yeah, so ones, basically main, main goal um for the 100 mile is re- is making sure bruce finishes this yeah, is his so first ever race yeah. this is on him i'm there just to make sure he crosses that finish line it's his first 100 mile. if you can remember back to your first one it's all about having fun and just completing it because after that you compare all your 100 miles back yes. to that first one so this one is to just make sure that all the tick boxes are done and he makes that race uh, the Lakeland 50, we've waited to go there for many years to do this race. So this one with my wife is to run alongside her um, and to make sure we enjoy it and have good fun in the scenery up in the lakes. We've never been there. Yeah. We're just looking forward to going and seeing it. So for those two, neither of them are going to be a, a push, um, but still it's, it's getting out there and putting some miles on the legs. Yeah, no, no. That, the, and they'll be good miles, I guess, as well, when it's yeah. with friends and family and that sort of thing. Well, geez, I hope you do get over to. Um, I didn't realize that you couldn't even get into America at all. No, not at all, mate. It's still at Amber. Even at Amber mm. State, you can. Um, hopefully by then, I think. Hopefully by then, I'll have my second jab as well. Um, yep. So that'll work in my favor. But um, at the moment, until America opens their doors, I don't know if any of the countries can fly. I know UK can't. Um, I'm not sure about. Can Australia fly in today yet? I don't know, but I do know um, at um, Barclay earlier this year there were Europeans going over to and, and got there. Yeah, some so, people were doing a, a two-week stay in a separate country that, that as long as they could do two weeks in a different country that was allowed in, they were then able then to fly from there into okay. America. I'm not yeah. that fortunate. I can't spend two weeks elsewhere to then no. fly in and spend time there. Yeah. Um, I need to be allowed to go there or not really. Um, yeah. I think I think it will open up. I'm I'm sure it will. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and honestly, I don't know well about Australia because Australia is a ban from leaving Australia by Australia. So yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, it doesn't so. matter who lets us in, we can't really go. <laughs> yeah, fair dues. Yeah. So anyway, and so um, where can people find you if they want to find you on social media? Okay, so I'm on Instagram. Uh, John Stocker Ultra Runner. Uh, I've got a page on Facebook, uh, John Stocker Ultra Runner as well. I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on Twitter as well. So I try to cover all four bases. I'm trying to get better at doing them. I really struggle at doing them. I try to, I do the Instagram quite well, but then I have to remember to do Twitter as well. Uh, I put <laughs> it on LinkedIn. So I'm on all of those at the moment. I'm trying my best with social media and to keep up to date with it and let people know what we're doing. Uh, and give them a bit of an insight of where we've come from and where we're going. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, it is a bit of work, but yeah, I know I know people are interested. So thank you. That'll be good if people can look you up there. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on an absolutely amazing achievement. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. No worries. Thanks.